Uh, thank you very much, host, uh, blessed Bishop, Dr. Julius, and uh, all uh, members. who are with Jacob Ongala. And this afternoon, I'm blessed to share with us uh, on the topic, how to handle money well in marriage. So I have a PowerPoint. I don't know, uh, host, could you just give me host, then I share my screen? Yes, please. You don't mind? Mm. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Post once more. The issue of money actually is very, very important in marriage. Money is core to so many things. You get your food because of money. You get your houses, your everything. Actually, uh, most of the things that we, 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 we possess, they are zeroed in on money. Number two, almost 60 to 70% of marriages which break, they break because of money. About 60 to, I mean, 50 to 60% of marriages that break they break because of money. So it is important, it is also a harm. And therefore, it is quite important that we understand how best do we handle money. Now, before we get to how best do we handle money, I want us to get some facts about money and then what are God's thoughts about money before we get to uh, know how to handle money. Actually, if you if you uh, know how to uh, if you know the facts about about money and what God you know uh, what are the thoughts of God about money, handling money will become very very easy. You won't really have problems. In fact, after sharing with you the facts about the biblical facts about money and the thoughts of God about money. I, I may even stop there. You'll have known what you need to do with money in your marriage. But I'm going to look at it in the biblical uh, I mean, approach uh, because I believe we are talking to people who uh, knows God, who are born again. Uh, and for those who are born again, now, uh, it is not very, very clear from Genesis to Revelation how to handle money in marriages. But there are guidelines that has been stated in the Bible how money can be handled in our family. Actually, everything that we meet in life, Bible has a solution. So I am going to look at some of the guidelines that the Bible has stated to enable us to understand the best way we can handle money. Now, as I mentioned, I'll start with the biblical facts about money. One, um, you need to understand this fact. God is not against rich people. Remember, what makes somebody rich in the, in the earthly, you know, in the earthly understanding, what makes you rich is money. And we can't run away from that. What makes you rich is money. And one thing that you need to understand, God is not against rich people. If you read from the book of um, Genesis, chapter 13, verse 2, 
I'll read it very, very fast. <clears throat> there are a number of scriptures that we'll be reading here and there, but um, 13 verses 2. The Bible says, uh, Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. If you know the story of Abram, Abram is one of the pillars, actually the pillars of salvation. And the way that the way the Bible looks at him, Abraham was very rich. When, when the Bible refers to the word very, it is abundant, it is a lot. So this gives you an understanding that even born again Christians can be rich. But the problem is when you now become rich, how do you handle your riches? There are some other several verses which I've have, which have stated there, you, you can look at them later when you are free. Uh, Genesis 24, uh, Genesis 30, and Job 1 and 3. They will tell you an understanding that God actually is not against the rich. So you should not sit back and say that, you know, I am born again. I cannot work hard to get to the highest level. No. God also recognize you in all those levels, at the level of uh, no money and at the level of with money. Number two, money does not mean blessed. And these facts are very, very important for you to uh, you know, uh, get them and have them in your marriage. Money does not mean blessed. If you happen to have the money, if you happen to acquire the money, don't uh, change that and, and, and let it mean that you're not blessed. No, that is not the meaning of blessing. And I want us to read from the book of Matthew chapter three, I mean, chapter five, verses three, what it says about blessings. Um, and I will read Matthew chapter five, verses three, the Bible says, Blessed are the poor. It starts with the, with the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of, of heaven. Uh, verses 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the, 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 inherit the earth. So all that chapter 5 uh, from verses 3 running up to uh, verses 12, it talks about what God means on blessing. So we should, one, not brag around and say that if we have some, a few millions or, or a few thousands, then we call ourselves blessed. No, that is not the essence of bless. However, it may, it may somehow be a component of blessing. If the money itself makes the worship of God be in the standard that God wants it. But if it brings a new dimension, a new way of life that takes you away from God, then its blessings, the way uh, it is now seen as a blessing now does not really mean blessing. So at the moment, we are not looking at money as being blessed. It's an opportunity that we are having um, uh, I mean, to, uh, to look after what God is owning, because later you will see that everything that we are, we are having on earth are owned by God. We are just stewards. We are just there to look after them. So if you have the opportunity to look after that millions and trillions of money, it is just, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it, it is just for a for, 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 for few, you know, few time, for few periods of time that you need to do that work of stewardship. Otherwise, uh, in the near future, it can get off your hook if you don't do your work well as a steward. So, number three, third fact, money can be an idol. Let us read from uh, First Timothy. Verses, uh, I mean, chapter 6, verses 10. First Timothy, 
um, First Timothy, the Bible says, chapter six, verse 10, the Bible says, for those, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith, uh, uh, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with the many griefs. So as much as you are getting into your marriage setup, you should not uh, look at money as everything. You should not love money so much. You should not look at money as you know uh, everything that is going to, to solve all your problems. I know some situations, uh, some people, they, they, they look at money like their whole life. If they have some little cash uh, or some little possessions, they can't even sleep. They can't even get and enjoy their marriage because of the little possessions which they have. Let that possession not drive you away from the love of God and from the love of your marriage. Otherwise, if you and all your hearts on that money, such that the 24 hours working money, or you want to spend 18 hours watching after your money. You only give me your six, six hours for sleeping. You will, you will find that you will look at the, the money as your next partner in marriage or as your small God, your small idol. Already one, you will will miss your relationship with God, and two, you will miss your relationship with your uh, spouse. So don't take money as everything. The next thing, what money you to bless, you are given to bless. Already we are getting into the, you know, utilization. But uh, uh, in this screen here, in this in this slide here, I'm still talking about the facts about money. But already you are seeing where we are moving towards. Now, if you read that, if you read the book of Luke, chapter six, verses thirty-eight, it does go through it. Luke chapter six, verses thirty-eight. The Bible says, give and it will be given to you. And good, a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. One of the secrets of uh, maintaining, uh, maintaining, your, maintaining your possession or maintaining the stewardship of what God has given you charge of is ensure that what you are what you are looking after, that money which you are looking after, the money that you are now possessing, you need to use it to bless others. Give and bless other people. That is when this 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 stewardship that you otherwise one thing that brings people down after they have attained some riches is because that they are looking at, 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 at what they have possessed as their own. Once you start looking uh, I mean, at money as your own, as, you know, this is my effort. This is my sweat. You know, um, somebody has got a whole, you know, uh, a, 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 a whole you know, box of clothes, whereby in one year, he can wear all the, you know, uh, all the clothes one by one individually, uniquely, each and every day. But somebody, the next neighbor, is walking in tattered clothes. This is what really angers God. When you have this possession, because whenever I'm talking of possession, I'm, I'm, I'm touching on money, because all this, they come because of money. 
once you have this stewardship over this money, over, over this possession, you are supposed to be using it to bless others, give to others, ensure that others are also eating from, I mean, under your table. Let them also enjoy what you're enjoying. And if you look at money in that perspective within your marriage, uh, all the possessions that have gathered within the, the marriage are going to be, you know, uh, blessed. Uh, God is going to be within that kind of a possession because already you won't look it as a priority in your marriage. Don't look at the those person as a priority. Um, the other thing is money is a trap. Many married couples, they fall into trap because of money. There are so many marriages that were started uh, on the basis of money. You have, you have had at some point, somebody says that, no, me, I can't marry now because I don't have a job. I don't have money. What will these people eat and so forth? And at some point, a lady might be complaining, no, I can't marry so-and-so. He's not having a, I mean, a good car. He's not having a house. He's having blah, blah, blah. Yes, fine. But if you get this person who is now having money and is having a house and is having a job and serving everything, Archbishop asks some that what about when you get into this marriage and then all this money goes away? What will happen? It means you got into this trap because of money. And therefore, if money goes away, this is where you, you hear of divorces, you hear of, of unfaithfulness, you hear of so many things, issues coming up in the marriage. So don't look at money as uh, the backbone or the, back, the foundation of marriage. Whenever, whenever you are getting into marriage, get into the marriage because you are directed by, the, by God, God himself. Because the foundation which we were taught in the first session is not, we didn't hear anything of money there. Let money find you in that marriage. And if it finds you, let it not trap you. Good. So those are some of the facts about uh, money. And there are so many other facts about money. Um, without passing, let me read this verse um, in chapter 8, verses 14 of Luke. There's something interesting there. Verses 14, the Bible says, The seed that fell among the thorns stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. That means what? Riches is one of the things that chokes your salvation. Money can really choke your, your faith. Once you get a trap on money, it will choke you. And then you will lose direction. And once you lose direction, you can't stand in your marriage. Good. So we are still continuing about uh, facts about money. Money is such a good thing but it can be a bad thing too, as uh, from my introduction. It's such a, I mean, a good thing. If you get to a house, you get to a family, early in the morning where there's money, they, they didn't have food and everything, you can just see the mood of that house. But if there is food, there is possession, there is everything, you know, every, every, everyone is happy. So it is, a, it is a good thing. All the things, I mean, all the possessions that, that we are having that are based on money. However, it is a bad thing. So you must be warned on that. Number two, we can own possessions, but the danger is that um, uh, they can also own us. And as, as I was saying that, as much as we are owning this possession, my car, my house, my what, my job, you know, you hear people talking of all those things. Yeah? So once you own those possession in that perspective, such that you want to tell your partner, stop, don't use that my car. Do you know this, this is my house? You know, my job, you know, those are parameters that makes your marriages ruin. When you own possession, don't ever reach at a point where these possessions owns you. And once they own you, is when you start to hear things like, my, my job, my land, my, you know, my, my property. 
that should not come into play in marriage and more so for a Christian marriage. There, I know different cultures have got different dimensions of understanding these possessions in marriage. But as I mentioned, we are basically looking at the biblical perspective because this is a spiritual marriage. This is a Christian marriage with the foundation which was, uh, uh, I mean, discussed with, with, with us by uh, Bishop in the morning. We are not comparing, uh, in, and in fact, we cannot compare a Christian marriage, a holy marriage, with a traditional marriage. And once you start doing that, you make your marriage look like that, you know, African marriage or you know that traditional marriage. We should not get to that that marriage starting to compare themselves with, you know, why are you not like so-and-so? And that so-and-so that they're referring to is an earthly person. So once you get to that point, then your position is driving you towards starting to say, Iron, Myron, and you will be owned. And once this position owns you, you will automatically become, a, 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 I mean, a slave of, of you. Position. Good. And we have close. So, one of the things or the facts about money is that a Christian who is in this marriage must be at a level of content, uh, uh, I mean, of more basic things that you should have. It has not even specified a car, it has not even specified a house, and so many other things. Economists will tell you that basically. Nowadays, they cut across even up to, and the important thing is to ensure that your body, which is now speaking with you now, have something to give it strength, which is the food, and we also have clothing to cover our nakedness. The rest is just by grace. So, if you happen, if you happen to have some extra on top of food and clothing, then it means it's by, just by grace. And that is found in uh, 1 Timothy 6, I mean, verses 8. Good. So uh, what is God's expectation on money? Well, how, I, I mean, God has got his own standards. The way you want To do to use money in marriage, but they are guided and then throw themselves. First understanding that you need to have is that what we are seeing, what we are having, is God's own. And once that is in your mind, you won't have a problem of saying, My car, my what, my my things, you know, all those kind of stuff. You won't see money as a problem in your marriage. Once you allow and you accept this fact that God owns it all then you won't have any issues with properties, with possessions, with money. That is one of the most important things that you need to understand as a Christian. It is not mine. I am just here as a steward. I'm just looking after this. When my time comes, you know, uh, somebody else will come over to look after it. And that, that's why when you die, when we are burying you, we don't bury you with the money and with the cars and with, the, with, the, with everything that, that we are, you are possessing. You go alone. And when you are born, you are born alone. Two, we are just stewards, as I've, uh, I mean, as I have said, and a steward is, is an employee. You are not the owner of that thing. And once you agree on that, that you are just, uh, I mean, a steward, you are, you are not the owner, life becomes very, very easy. You won't struggle. You won't struggle. Because if you are just an employee, just been put there to look after the riches, 
You are only looking after what has been brought to you. You don't go out of your way to now start bringing more things to look after. You look after what you have been asked to look after. Otherwise, uh, you will go beyond your stewardship. So understand that concept that whatever little God has provided in your marriage, that marriage has been enthroned to steward over it. And that is very, very key. Um, number three, money is not a solution. But it is important. Money is not a solution. I want us to read that that verse. That is Proverbs eleven, verse uh, twenty-eight. Proverbs eleven, verses twenty-eight. And the Bible says, "Those who trust on their riches will fall. If you first of all trust in your monies." you will fall. So as a couple, don't trust that our problems that we are having within our marriage can be solved with money. No. It is like a green leaf. So the most, of the, the, the most important thing is to look at your righteousness, not the money. If you want to, move along and go to the highest level. Moving on. It's not because of their marriages didn't stand. Why? If money could have solved everything, then why did they, why did their marriages fail? So money is not a solution in marriage. But remember, as I mentioned, it is important. This should not make you sit back and relax and say, uh, you know, presenter said that money is not, is not the, the solution and therefore from today I won't go to work. You will go to work. You must go to work and bring money and ensure you, you, you pay your bills. However, let it not be the solution for everything. Good. So next one is the purpose of money is not to provide security. It's not to provide to provide establishment. Yeah? I'm going to this marriage because you know that man is, is, is employed on permanent basis and therefore I am sure of eating until I die. No. Not that is not the plan of God. I want to be established. I want an established passion. I want to be an independent. I want to, to be an independent person. You know, some people they look for money to have power. Money cannot give you power. Some people are looking for money because they want influence. No, remember, God look at money to provide for your own needs. God gives you that money to provide for your own needs. God gives you that possession to indicate direction of your life. So that you have a testimony. Oh, yesterday I was hungry. I didn't have clothes. But today God has provided for me. I can now wear clothes. At least it will change your faith. Your, it, will, it, will, it will increase your faith in believing in God. And that comes in when you understand that this money cannot answer all my problems, but when it comes, it is by, by, by grace. God looks at money to unite believers together in giving. The understanding, the expectation of God, if you are a believer and you are in the midst of believers and God blesses you, it should be uh, uh, understood that God expects me who has not been blessed or given some possession to bless others. And once I bless other believers, it unites the believers. During the, the time of uh, Paul uh, in his ministry, believers used to share their belongings together. In unity, they come together, they've been together, they share. Yeah. So that one is what God is expecting from how you handle your money. Number four, God expects money to demonstrate his supernatural power to the world. You've been hearing testimony. I so and so was just a beggar. The 
the, the other day. But since he got born again, God has raised him. God has brought him up, you know. God uses that to show his supernatural power. Supernatural power. It means it, it gives to everyone as according to his will. And that, if you read in, the, in, in Malachi, chapter, uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 10, which talks about God opening the doors and windows of heaven. You know, until there is nowhere, you can put them. Until there is nowhere, you can put them. There are some marriages, I mean, some uh, uh, couples who are in marriage, they are born again. But they don't even, you know, consider God in their possession. They don't even look at, you know, giving their tithes, for example. And this verse is only invoked when you give part of your possession as tithes. And God actually is going to show his supernatural power to us. Great. So after having those perspectives, the facts about money, and God's perspective, I mean, expectation on money, then now we can go to how do we manage money in our marriages now. Number one, point number one is very, very important. One of the ways that you need to think whenever you want to get money, it should come from a clean source. You need to work for that money. Second Thessalonians 3 verses 10. I'll read that. That's Okay, three verses 10. The Bible says, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. It means whenever you have not worked for this wealth, you are not expected to eat from it. If you want to have your position or your mind, let it come from a clean source. Very, very important. Before even you start, let it, you should be in a position to explain that my one thousand dollars, I got it from the job I did from A and B in time A and B. But if you are having the money and you can't even explain where it came from, you need to get back to your drawing board. It should come from a clean source. And that, that one now spells out that for those who are in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in businesses or in jobs, it spells out that corruption money should not be introduced into the family. The money that is gotten in a wrong way should not be introduced into the family. Otherwise, it brings curse to the family. And everyone that eats that money is going to, to get that curse and, 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 it, and it can follow them up to, to the seventh generation. Number two, honor God with your money. Whenever you are managing money, it needs to be in a honor of God. It should, it should honor God. Let us read, read from that verse, please. Proverbs verses... Um, uh, three, Proverbs verses three, verse, uh, I mean, chapter three, verses nine, the Bible says, honor the Lord with your wealth, honor with your wealth. It means if you are a steward and you are the possessor of this possession we are talking about, let them honor God. You should not be in a, position, a situation whereby you have this job of yours and you have this business of yours. Is even taking time for God. Is even taking time for the family. You can't even get a single minute to, to, to worship and thank God. Some people, once they get this, this possession, before they get the money, they are very good people and they are born again. They can serve God very, very well. But once the possession comes, God aside. And that is not the way we can manage our money well in a family. When it comes, let it come with an increased effort of serving God. Let it come with an increased effort of serving God. 
Uh, third one. Provide basics for your family and avoid selfishness. As I said, money is important in marriage. The first thing is should be able to provide the basics for your family. Don't get your money if you are if you are a husband or your wife, whoever is working, whoever is uh, doing some kind of activity to generate money for the family. You get this money and then you hide it. This money should provide the basics for the family. And remember the basics we said about the clothing, the food, the schooling and everything. It should be meant to be enjoyed by the family. Don't be selfish. You find uh, like a husband, he buys you know, shoes every, every month. He has to buy shoes, not thinking about the wife, not thinking about the, the children. He wants to wait until the wife asks, oh, Baba, uh, Jane, my shoes is now torn. I can't go with you in that journey. Are you getting that? Or until your child asks you, Daddy, my school uniform is so torn and the teacher said that I cannot go to school because my, uh, my, my uniform is torn. Yet you, the father, you are having lorries of jackets and lorries of coats and suits in your wardrobes. That is selfishness. Your money should help in providing basics to your family. Um, and by the way, that one also goes to the, to the mothers, to the, I mean, female spouses. If, if God has enthroned you with the, you know, uh, job or business and you're the one providing, if that's, if that happens, then again, it should, it should, it should, it should, um, replicate. Don't get your money and you say money, which I earn is for myself. And the money for my for my husband is for ours. It never worked that, that way in marriage. In marriage, when you get, you bring it together and you work with it together. You provide for the family. Now, number four, examine your relationship with money. Both of you, when you, you get married, you have different dimensions of how you perceive money. Maybe one of you is a saver but the other one is a spender. See, spends, if you give opportunities to spend, is somebody that you can never give a TM and, and say, please withdraw some money and do some shopping. She will spend everything. Not knowing that tomorrow is coming also. Not knowing that children need to go to school. Maybe you, uh, as, a, as a man, you have saved for maybe some, for some years. Maybe you are saving to buy a house, buy a plot or something. And then one day you say, ah, we have some money, Mama Miriam. We have some money, and this money, please take this ATM and uh, go and buy some, you know, some clothes for, for for the children. But don't, you know, you trust everything. I know there are, you know, there are different classes that you have been living in. Like in Kenya, I know there are shops like Mr. Price. I know there are shops, you know, very beautiful shops that are very expensive. My life, I've been always wearing a particular brand of clothes at some level. What actually happens on a, in one second when I see an ATM that makes me now to multiply one clothes which I was buying at 1,000, no, I want to buy it at 10,000, why? So if you're a saver and somebody else is a spender, you need to agree in this family. Agree, please. I know this is what I understood from you, and I know this is not what you always do. Can we agree on this, our differences, and make sure that we, we utilize whatever we are having so that you help the saver and you also help the, the spender? Very, very important. Try to bring yourself into consensus, please. Uh, I do not have a biblical backing on that. As I said, uh, we are getting you know, some guidance from the Bible and then we relate to what we are experiencing in our life. Now, if you are in that marriage, don't assume things that things will go the way you want them. 
you must sit down, both of you, plan short-term goals and long-term goals. Short-term goals are those, you know, those things that you need to spend on within a month, within a week, within two weeks, within like that. But long-term goals are those big projects for the family, big projects for the family, okay? So that when you get the money, you need to plan before getting the money. If you wait until money comes, is when you budget, it becomes very, very hard. But sit down plans that this year, whenever you are drawing your year's resolution, draw that this year, if we want to buy a plot, for example. How are we going to restructure our short-term uh, I mean, uh, uh, goals for money so that we do not, we do not, we do not really fail to reach our goal at the end of it. It's very, very important. So planning and budgeting is, is a key to any financial management. Any financial management without planning, without budgeting is wrong. It's very, very wrong. So ensure you plan. Uh, Next one, prioritize your expenditure. <laughs> and this one is very, very common in many families. They don't prioritize. Now, when you are doing budgeting and you go to, to the supermarket, somebody has bought, for example, has bought uh, wheat flour oil. In addition, he buys mandazis and scotches. Then why, why were you buying the, the wheat flour and the oil? He is one person that walks in the way, on the way, and any that is being sold, that is being eaten, this person will buy. He, nothing can pass by him without buying that particular thing. And this is very, very common with, uh, with our female spouses. Okay? And even men, uh, they, you know, they just get to, to, to their family, you know, uh, home there, finds some mess and say, oh, you are here, you are, you are not going to school, please take this one. You know very well that you had budgeted in your house that this hundred dollar, you are supposed to be using it to buy in your house. And you say that you, the money that you had, you have, you have given out, out, it will bring conflict. And sure, you prioritize you are spending. If it is a time for giving, give, but make sure you prioritize. Okay, good. And then keep track of your expenditure. <laughs> this is very, very hard for those who, are, who don't want to be faithful on their, on their possessions, on their monies. They don't, if, they are, if you ask, if you, want, if you want a war in that marriage, you ask, how did you spend this money? And these are things that need to be defined at the start of your, you know, of your investment. You say, uh, my love, we, have, we, we know very well that we earn, at the end of the month, we earn $20,000. And this is how we have budgeted to use it. At the end of using it, you sit down, both of you, and say, I had 20,000, I used 15, I'm still remaining with five. Be free to discuss or track the, your expenditure. And if you are asked by your spouse about the expenditure, be open and be free to share. Unless you use it wrongly, unless you use it wrongly is when you'll, be, you'll fail to share. Accountability is very, very important. And whenever God has put you as a steward, God requires you to be accountable for everything you use within your stewardship. Um, do not spend what you don't have, uh, what you don't have, sorry. Do not spend what you don't have. Be contented. <laughs> uh, this is the reason why many people get into loans that they cannot repay. You spend what you, you, you don't have. Don't spend what you don't have. You know very well that your spouse gets $10,000. Why do you do a budget of $15,000? Where do you expect him to get the money? Where the money is? So, 
ensure whenever you are spending, you only spend on what you on what you have. That is the aspect of being contented is coming by. Be contented with your fifteen thousand dollars, because you don't have a particular dress for Christmas. You want now to raise the budget for December because you want to wear as you know your fellow uh, friends. Please make sure you are contented to avoid any fuckers in the marriage. Good, and then this discuss distribu this contribution towards supporting parents and other donations. Okay. This is one thing that uh, 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 mostly men are weak on. Whenever they want to support their parents, they say, ah, it's me who is working. Why should I, why should you ask me when I'm supporting my parents? Or why should you ask me when I give my friend, you know, uh, some donation? No, discuss that support that you want to do. I know it is good. Yes, it is very good. But discuss it with your spouse or any other donations. The donations are good. Already in, in the in the uh, uh, in the Bible, we have seen that um, uh, we need to give, we need to donate, we need to bless other people. But this should come as a discussion, a result of discussion that you have you have discussed within your family, within your uh, marriage. Ensure you share and discuss widely. And the same also goes to the uh, female spouse, um, spouses. Whenever you are you want to support your parents and God has blessed you with, 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 with their job. Don't, don't support them and then you come to report. Ah, I earned my money, but you see, uh, I, I gave my mom uh, half of my salary because she said that she is not having one, two, three things in the house. So I only, I'm only having a half of the, the salary which I earned. No, come and discuss with your spouse and then you agree, then you, 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 you support. Who knows? He might even add you more to go and support that, that problem when you, you discuss it. And then decides on financial arrangement for children. In marriage, one thing that you can't assume is that children will come. When children come, they come with responsibilities. And the child will not know whether you are working or not working. Whenever you are planning for your finances, plan for your children. I have seen some marriages whereby the man is working, a wife is working, but children fail to go to school because they didn't plan. Yet they're driving very good cars, they're staying in a very good house, they're eating very, very well, but children cannot dress well. So ensure that because children are part of this family. Marriage, one of the uh, 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 the, the offsprings for marriage is children, and you must plan for them in advance. Children, they, they, they need food, they need clothing, they need education, and they, they need any other thing, any basic need that they might, might, might make them live comfortably. So when you are doing your financial planning, put them in the picture. And if you don't have them now, um, um, I'm giving now this story, uh, uh, I mean, uh, personal story, back at home there. Something happens that uh, somebody knows very well that the wife has been expecting for the last nine months. And then on the date of delivery is when you, you, you hear him asking, I don't even have a cloth for, for the child. And he has, he has been expecting the, the, the child for nine months. It means there was just lack, lack of planning somewhere. You need to plan for, and when you look at their life, they have been having food every day. They're having so many other things. The house is full of, of stuff and possession and everything. Plan for these children. Make the financial and investment records open and available to both partners. If you are, uh, uh, on job, I know different employers, they have different packages. You know, some, sometimes you are deducted some pension, sometimes you are buying a mortgage, sometimes you are uh, contributing to some uh, financial, you know, investment. Don't make your partner look a fool. 
if accidentally you die, for example. Because if you do an investment that is only you who knows, if anything happened, God forbid, then your family or your spouse might not benefit from them. And my, your family or your spouse might not understand why you do not have money. Bring them on board and tell them and, and tell your spouse, please. The reason why you 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 saw my pay slip, I'm supposed to, I'm earning fifty thousand dollars, for example. But the reason why I am bringing only thirty thousand dollars is because twenty I am putting it in this investment. Don't hide it. She will now know that when we are budgeting for the month, we only budget for the, for the thirty. If you don't make them often, that's where you you say uh, your spouse is asking you for money and not no very well that you've, you've not earned but still asking for money because she feels that you earn 50 but we have only spent 30 where is that 20 because you are investing somewhere but you're you're afraid to become open please be open the other thing which is very very important for a family is before you get to an investment study that investment well otherwise you might end up in, into a pyramid scheme don't just rush because somebody walked into your office to sell an idea to you, and then you rush. Get to know, understand the investment. Discuss with your spouse. Your spouse could be having an idea about it, and so forth. Discuss, and then you agree before you engage in such investment. Otherwise, you might get into some investments, which are in the long run, you might lose. And if you lose, of course, the, the family will also lose. So ensure that before you engage in any investment, you study it very, very well and discuss again also with your spouse. Uh, stop chasing money, but purpose, lest you can fall in a scam. Don't chase money, but chase purpose. If you continue chasing money, you end up getting corrupt, for example. You end up getting caught or you can end up getting in a scam. Don't chase for money. Let money come at its own time. Work for it, it will come, but don't chase it. Chasing it here, I mean, all your life you devote in looking for money. You travel all over looking for money. Remember, by the time you are devoting yourself to chasing money, the time that you should be having with, with, with your marriage life, is not going to be there. And immediately you put your life in, in chasing money, you are likely to get into a problem that reversing it becomes very, very hard. So take time with your family, enjoy your family, enjoy with, with your family and do the work that is designated for you, get the money and buy your basics. Don't go for chasing money, please. Uh, one of the things that some people fails to, uh, um, some marriages fails to do is uh, uh, building a, an emergency fund. Have you ever asked yourself if something happens now in your marriage that requires money, what will you do? It is very, very important to have a backstop. Building an emergency fund for a family is very, very important because you do not know when emergency will come. Uh, if you are all depending on salary, for example, and uh, you are in the midst of the month around 22nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, at the very hard time for, for the month, you've cleared all your monies or you've budgeted all your monies, and then your pastor and your bishop walks in. You can't even afford a cup of tea to give them, even a, a glass of juice. You need to have some emergency fund that we are budgeting, but we have to have some $5 somewhere that in case something happens, we can give. Okay, I'm almost through. Very important, pay off debts, pay off debts. If you don't pay debts, you will leave that, that family in problems. Pay off debt, debt is a responsibility. It is a responsibility 
And if you are a, a debt, you are close to a sinner. You are almost <laughs> touching the environment of sinners. So pay off your debts and be freed. If you are a debt, you are a slave. If you have debt, you are a slave. And you are a slave to that person who gave you the, the debt. Because every time you see him or you see them, you will hide if you don't pay your debts. In my concluding remarks, good management of resources is, is in successful institutions requires that there's good organizational structure. Good management of resources in a successful institution requires that there's good organizational structure. How do we make our managers a good organizational structure? Don't struggle. Already we have a structure which has been given by God. In marriage too, there, uh, the structure was defined by God himself. And I want to conclude by reading that verse. Um, Ephesians 2, 22 verses 5. Ephesians, sorry. Ephesians 5, 22 to 25. And the Bible says, Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. You, you know, we, when you are reading this verse of wife submission, I want you to read the whole of it. You read the whole statement. The statement says, Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Us. <laughs> Don't submit the way you want. Don't submit whenever you want. The Bible says, submit us the way you submit to the Lord. Very, very important. And then you skip to verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. I believe now, husbands who are on this forum, you need to start repenting because you might want to say now, I have never loved my wife the way Christ loved the, the, the church. Read that verse full, in full. Husbands, love your wife as the way Christ loved the church. That is the word, that is the structure that God himself gave us. That is the structure that God himself gave us. The important principle in the God of decision is to do all to the glory of God. Whenever you are managing your funds, whenever you are managing your resources, do it to the glory of God and God himself. Thank you very much, and may God bless your marriages. Uh, I don't want to receive the questions, but I'm going to open the question for all of us. Money issues is, is not something which I can answer all the questions which you're having. Let us raise the questions and anybody with an answer will give us the answer. Over to you, Bishop and the host. Amen. Uh, we have a question and answer session at the end of the conference, of the seminar. Uh, I would encourage that we write down our questions. Write down your questions at the very end. I've just posted uh, the, the reminder of the program on, uh, on the chat. Uh, as you can see, there is a question and answer session. At the end, please write down your money questions. I'm sure there are a lot. Um, just write them down and then prepare them for that time. Is that a good deal? I think that's a good deal. Uh, let me let me give us a, a short break before we go into the next session. Um, our bishop is having a problem with the network, so we'll just go into a, a short break and then I'll present the the topic on uh, conflict resolution. Amen. I'll present on conflict conflict resolution, and. Uh, and then uh, we'll continue from there.
Amen.